This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Thirty-year-old Army Staff Sergeant Billy Ray Hargrove wanted to spend his life in the military. But in February of 1992, Hargrove was found dead, hung by the neck in his own backyard. Incredibly, just six weeks later, Hargrove's best friend, Sergeant Mike Carmichael, was also found dead, hung from a barracks locker. What happened to Billy Ray Hargrove and Mike Carmichael? Congress is currently looking into these deaths and several other cases where American servicemen have died under questionable circumstances. In each case, the military has ruled suicide or accident, but some family members and friends are crying murder, perhaps not without reason. Join us for this intriguing investigation and more on Unsolved Mysteries. In the early 1980s, the resort mecca of Miami, Florida, found itself in the midst of an urban crisis. First, the city was deluged by more than 120,000 refugees from Cuba. Among them were 30,000 hardcore criminals. Simultaneously, racial tensions were polarizing the populace, and in the summer of 1980, six days of rioting convulsed the city. In response, Miami doubled the size of its police force between 1980 and 1983. It was an unprecedented expansion, but the accelerated pace exacted a price. According to some, a handful of questionable applicants slipped through the screening process, and soon Miami had yet another problem. Corrupt officers at the heart of its police department. It began almost quietly. The early abuses were minor shakedowns, and the targets, small-time drug dealers. A number of the early rip-offs were simple car stops, where the police officers would see small amounts of drugs and money, and would proceed to take those drugs and money, uh, believing that uh, the people who they were stopping weren't going to report those incidents to the police department. They felt that they were invincible as long as they stood together. As long as no one talked, it was their word against common thugs on the street. Nada. Well, these police officers succumbed to greed, and they would go out and say they were not harming law-abiding citizens. And that's how they rationalized and justified a lot of their crimes that they committed. One of the most notorious of the rogue officers was Armando Garcia. In high school, he was associated with a group of drug users, ties he had been able to hide when he joined the police force. Garcia was not content with nickel and dime shakedowns. He grew bold enough to confiscate literally boatloads of drugs and bogus police operations that were totally off the record, raids which eventually escalated into violence. In July of 1985, Garcia learned that some 400 kilos of pure cocaine would soon arrive in Miami. He had allegedly intercepted a similar shipment two weeks before, and it seemed as easy as taking candy from a baby. Miami police, drop and go! But this time, Garcia's plans went south. Six of the dopers jumped in the water to escape the police officer, thinking it was an official raid. Three of them drowned. 
the officers left with 400 kilos of cocaine. Metro Dade Police Department began the investigation immediately after the three bodies were found, and they thought it was a routine homicide. I need you to tell me exactly what it was you saw. Sure, I, I saw police cars come into the yard. How many? There were three of them. What department? The uh, City of Miami Police Department. Detectives were stunned I mean, when a harbor security guard said the three men had drowned oh, while fleeing a police raid. See. Official police logs had no record of such a raid. Further investigation blew the lid off Armando Garcia's secret life. Ultimately, he and 34 other Miami police officers were arrested on corruption charges. No tenemos otro remedio. We have no choice. Hay que eliminarlos. We must eliminate our problem. While in prison, Garcia and several other officers allegedly hatched a secret plot to kill a number of the witnesses scheduled to testify against them. In January of 1986, after four months in jail, Garcia and several associates made bail. According to investigators, they lost no time putting their murder plans into action against one of the prosecution's top witnesses. They supplied $50,000 to one hit man for that hit, but it did not take place. He took their money and did not commit the hit. And they attempted, even themselves, they hid in the bushes waiting for one of the government witnesses but never could find him. In the end, none of the witnesses were harmed. But in spite of their testimony, the corruption case against Garcia and his co-defendants ended in a mistrial. By then, however, evidence of the assassination plots had come to light. The former officers were indicted on a second set of charges, including conspiracy to commit murder. Several of the officers after the indictment decided that they would cooperate. The other officers realized then that the case had reached a point where it was almost a sure conviction if they went to court. At that point, they made a decision to take flight. Armando Garcia disappeared in May of 1987. He is 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighs 185 pounds, and has brown hair and brown eyes. Garcia was born in Cuba, and police now fear he may have slipped away to South America. He is married and is known to have two young daughters, ages 3 and 4. Authorities are also seeking Garcia's father, Toribio Dagoberto Garcia. He is 55 years old, balding, and has brown eyes. He stands five feet six inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. A third suspect wanted in this case is Victor Zapata, another former officer. Zapata is five feet nine inches tall, weighs 175 pounds, and has brown hair and brown eyes. Next, two friends turn out to be brother and sister. Perhaps you can help find the rest of the family. It was just three days before Christmas in 1964. A young woman from Flint, Michigan, named Faith Marie Brown, stole out for a late night joyride with two friends. Miraculously, the driver survived the crash, but both passengers were killed instantly. Faith Brown was dead at the age of 26. In addition to her parents and four brothers, Faith left behind seven children under the age of 10. The untimely death of Faith Marie Brown added one final tragic twist to the already complicated lives of her four sons and three daughters. Two divorces and now the fatal car crash has scattered the children to five different families. It seemed they would be separated forever until a young woman named April Kurgis, who'd been adopted as a child, 
set out to find her biological parents. In 1992, April was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, a hereditary disease. Concerned about her own children's health, April began her search, one with more than his share of surprises. It all started in the records office of Shiawassee County, Michigan. I told them that I knew my name was Michelle Brown at birth, and that my birthday was um, September 18th, 1961, and I was adopted, and I'd like uh, any information available on my adoption. Um, there's another child named Brown. I kind of glanced over and I seen the name Michael Brown right underneath mine, and so I knew I had a brother. May I take a look at that? April was not permitted to examine the records. Strict regulations govern the release of adoption files, and April petitioned a county judge for access to the information. Three days later, she received this letter. It contained the astonishing revelation that April had four brothers and two sisters However, the key details that would allow her to find them had been omitted. April Kurgis was trapped in a bureaucratic catch-22. I was a little bit upset that there wasn't more information released um, on, the, on the other brothers and sisters. We were, we're all over the legal age, and it's, you know, we're all mature adults now, and we should be able to handle it. And I, I was a little bit upset that they wouldn't give us any more than they did, but yet thankful that they at least give me that much. I never even knew you were adopted. Yeah. Mike Galloway, funny. the husband of April's best friend, Deb, had also been adopted. Mm -hmm. He was especially curious about April's investigation. Well, later. I mean, I knew that my birth name was Brown, but they weren't willing to divulge any other names. Your birth name is Brown? Yeah. That's funny. My adopted parents told me my birth name was Brown. Oh, you're kidding. Could I see the letter? <laughs> sure. When I showed Mike the letter, he looked at it in the paragraph where it said, I had a brother born in Owasso in 1960. He kind of looked over the top of the letter and said, I was born in Owasso in 1960, and my last name was Brown. We thought it would be funny if we were brother and sister, but we really didn't think that was a possibility. Brown's a common name, and when it was brought up, it's just like Smith or Jones or you know any other common name like that. So I'm the type of person that likes to see things in writing or in, in my face before I actually settle down to believe that it's true. Remember when our daughter Amber was born? The next morning, April met Mike and Deb at their house. Mike's adoptive parents had often told That's him right. that he had a sister named Michelle. Try to find Michelle. Wait a minute. Did you say your sister's name was Michelle? Yeah. Michael, my real name is Michelle Brown. We knew it, it had to Don't be that we were brother and sister. Don't try to tell me that this is another coincidence. We uh, jumped up and we hugged each other and, and Deb and said, we can, I can't believe I've known you for eight years and now I find out you're my brother. This is, this is too wild. I'm kind of glad that April and I didn't meet first and then start dating, you know, and end up getting married or something, because then that would have been uh, kind of shocking <laughs> to have kids with your own sister, I suppose. Mike and April matched information from the county files with recollections primarily from Mike's adoptive parents. Soon a picture began to emerge of their birth mother, Faith Marie Brown. Come on, we really need to talk about this now. Not in here. When she was just 16 years old, Faith had dropped out of high school to be married. By the time she was 20, she already had four children, including twin boys. Faith would lose them all when her young marriage ended in divorce. What are you talking about? They're coming with me, and if you try to fight me, Faith, I will take you to court. At the heart of the conflict was her husband's belief that another man had fathered the twins. Why are you raising them either? Why are you doing this? Because I want to do what's best for the kids. Mike and April would later learn that their father was yet another man, 25 years older than their mother. For a while. From what we know, um, our mother had a very hard time at anything she ever done. She had kids one right after the other, and like she wasn't responsible for them, she would give them up for adoption or they would eventually be taken away. I don't think she could really handle the responsibilities of having the kids. 
In 1962, Michigan Social Services took custody of April and Michael. Three months later, their father and Faith had another daughter, Shannon. After Faith died, Shannon was put up for adoption and the records sealed in county files. Okay. We can see My Fair Lady again. We believe that um, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Dennis is our father. And as far as we know or have been able to find out, he is still alive. Um, we'd like to be able to get in touch with him, more or less to say hi and see what kind of a person he's like. But if he doesn't want, even if he doesn't want a relationship with us, we would still at least like a chance to say hello. It's pretty frustrating because we have a, a lot of little pieces of information and it's like a, a puzzle that's missing half the pieces. I think it was fate that, uh, that brought April and I together. Uh, I hope it's fate that brings April and I and our other brothers and sisters together. Living in a small town like we do, uh, we've wondered if some of the people we've met may be related to us, and we never knew it. I've, we've had people say, you know, do you have a sister that lives in St. John? Because you sure remind me of somebody. Well, before I say no, not that I know of. Well, now I can't say that. I may have. Together, April and Mike tried to locate their five lost siblings, William, Wanda, Shannon, and twins Keith and Kenneth. But none of their leads paid off until the night of our broadcast. That evening, four of Faith Brown's missing children were watching. All five contacted our phone center within 24 hours. April and Michael quickly made plans to host a remarkable family reunion. They would soon be face to face with two sisters and three brothers, who until recently they didn't even know existed. The first to arrive were William, Shannon, and Wanda. Woo! All right. What are you up to? What are you doing? When we started hugging, didn't want to stop. And it was like seeing old friends or something. It was overwhelming, <laughs> joyous, uh, happy. Uh, a whole bunch of emotions all wrapped up in one. When I hugged April, it was something, I don't know what it was. It was just some. I felt something inside. And I noticed she keeps looking at me and I keep looking at her and, <laughs> you know, it's just strange to look so like somebody. When Kenneth and Keith showed up, the reunion was complete. For Mike Galloway, it was a moment he thought might never arrive. Hey, how you doing? All right. What's up, Kenneth? When you're adopted out and you know that, the, that there's other brothers and sisters out there, you don't really feel like you're a whole person. And with finding all the rest of them, it just it kind of makes you feel like you're a whole person, like your whole life is now back in order. Look at the hairs. Oh, jeez. The party exceeded everyone's wildest expectations. With a total of 33 family members present, it was one of Unsolved Mysteries' largest reunions ever. Just knowing that there's family out there, it means a lot. Because it's a part of Mom. And now, with all the brothers and sisters being together, she'll live on with us forever now. And today, I think she's going to rest in peace. This is a national cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas, the final resting place for hundreds of soldiers, sailors, and pilots, veterans of every major conflict in the history of this country. Also buried here are two men who are at the center of one of the most intriguing mysteries we have ever encountered. Recently, we came across this article in the Philadelphia Inquirer which investigative reporter David Zucchino outlined the cases of 40 U.S. servicemen who died under questionable circumstances. Every case has been ruled either a suicide or a self-inflicted accident by the military. Yet in each instance, there seems to be evidence that defies the official ruling. In May of 1993, the families of 14 soldiers said to have taken their own lives testify before the House Armed Services Committee 
Each family claimed their son did not commit suicide. Tonight, we'll be looking at two of the most baffling cases, the cases of Sergeant Billy Ray Hargrove and Sergeant Mike Carmichael. The Army has refused to participate in our broadcast and stands by the judgment that the two soldiers killed themselves. Both families say the Army is dead wrong. Mike didn't have nothing to die for, no more than Billy had to die for. Neither one of them committed suicide. They didn't do it. Billy Ray Hargrove and Mike Carmichael led similar lives and suffered similar deaths. Both had planned careers in the military since childhood. Both had joined the Army in their teens and become the best of friends as they climbed the ranks. Both had married Korean women while stationed in the Far East. Tragically, Billy Ray Hargrove and Mike Carmichael died within six weeks of each other. And according to the Army, they committed suicide in a similar manner. During Operation Desert Storm, Billy Ray Hargrove and his outfit were sent from their base in Germany to Saudi Arabia. However, the conflict ended before the platoon saw active duty. When Billy finished Desert Storm and went back to Germany, he was disappointed because his men did not get a merit award, a medal, that he felt like they deserved. And he set about trying to get the medal for him, and every direction he went in, he, he couldn't accomplish it. We're wondering when you'd recommend us for the Desert Storm decoration. Billy Ray, I appreciate everything you and the men did during the campaign. But since the unit did not go into combat, I'm refusing the application. Sir, I understand your point, but the men were just I've as... decided to refuse the application. Billy Ray could not Sir, accept the Army's decision Sergeant. and made a questionable decision of his own. He forged his superior Sir. signature on the appropriate documents. A short time later, his men received their medals. A few months passed. In June of 1991, Billy Ray arrived in Korea for another tour of duty. At the airport, he met his wife, Kim, and unexpected trouble. Sergeant Hargrove? Yes, sir. I'm here to place you under arrest for treason. Willis, remove the Desert Storm commendation. Uh, uh, sir, uh, but w what's this about? Take him into custody, Jim. Come on, Just sir. come with uh, me. Come on. Uh, I'll call you. I'll call you. Billy Ray called me January the 28th and told me, Dad, I think I'm going to get out of the military. I've had all of it I can stand. And he said, I'll probably be home by June. Billy Ray's court-martial was not his only problem. In particular, his marriage to Kim had begun to fall apart, and Billy Ray began making plans to divorce her. I had visited their house and they were fighting a lot and there was a lot of jealousy she was constantly accusing him of having a girlfriend and having a child somewhere that she didn't know anything about and it wasn't true at all well i don't think they're going to kick me out uh, i may lose some rank but i'm gonna re-up i think it's the right call man i've been telling you that yeah right another eight Where's months passed kill? According to Billy Ray's family, the controversy surrounding the forged documents began to subside, and Billy Ray told his best friend, Mike Carmichael, that he had re-enlisted. Hey, Hargrove! February 20th, 1992, the day of Billy Ray Hargrove's death. Billy Ray had missed his summons to report to duty, and at 9.20 a.m., one of his fellow sergeants showed up at his doorstep. Hey, Billy! Where you been? I was just having breakfast. Oh, did you not hear the siren? Uh, no. Is are we having a drill? Yeah, and the captain's going ballistic. <clears throat> but he is. Uh, tell him I'm on my way. Okay, good deal. See you later. Inexplicably, Billy Ray never reported for duty. Instead, he took his dog for a walk. <coughs> Twenty minutes later, Kim heard the dog barking. Kim found Billy Ray hanging by the neck from a nearby tree. Bill, what are you doing? An alleged suicide note was found in Billy Ray's pants pocket. 
It read in part, my life is really screwed up now and I just don't know how to fix it. I've been thinking a lot about taking my life for a long time now. Goodbye, signed William R. Hargrove. However, Billy Ray's mother questions whether he wrote the note. I looked at the writing and I did not believe it was his writing. It did not look to me like his writing. The Army acknowledges a possibility that the suicide note might not have been in Billy Ray's handwriting. Even so, they ruled that he had killed himself, speculating that he had been driven to suicide by his upcoming court-martial and divorce. He was not the type of person to commit suicide, no matter what, uh, especially putting a rope around his neck. I, I just could not believe it, and I still don't believe it. Something happened to him, but he did not commit suicide. The autopsy report yielded another piece of mysterious evidence that seemed to bolster Sue Nunnally's claim. Billy Ray had unexplained abrasions and lacerations on his face and hands. That would indicate to me that someone had been in a scrape or a fight, but the military in their report didn't question anyone or ask where the scratches come from. They just ignored them. Billy Ray Hargrove was laid to rest on March 4th, 1992. One of the mourners at his funeral was his old friend, Mike Carmichael. I do know that there was one part of the scripture. When I finally did meet Mike, it was at Billy's funeral when he brought Billy's body back home. And he told me, he said, I said, We'll give them hell. We're going to make them pay. The SOBs pay for what they done. After the service, Mike returned to the Hargroves' house with Billy Ray's family. He looked at me and he promised and he told me that if it was the last thing he ever did, he was going to find out what happened to Billy Ray. Just don't do anything until you hear from me. Okay. Bye. Mike Carmichael's uncle Oscar served in the Marines for 20 years. He is now suffering from emphysema well, really and told us that I Mike believed there was a larger conspiracy involved. And there had been three other Army personnel there in uh, Korea that had supposedly committed suicide. And my nephew told his birth mother, says, don't be surprised if I'm not next. On March 22, 1992, Mike Carmichael returned to Korea and immediately began his own investigation. He, he and his wife, Sun Hee, visited Billy Ray's widow, Kim, and collected Billy Ray's personal day, papers. Included was a letter Billy Ray had written to his father a few days before the hanging, but Harvey Hargrove says he never received the correspondence. He was supposed to have written me a letter, uh, sometimes, in February, I don't know when, but he was supposed to have written me a letter. And I'm sure if I could find that letter, it would explain everything. Mike continued collecting Billy Ray's papers and stored them with his own papers in a metal box. Mike instructed his uncle Oscar that if anything were to happen to him, Oscar should immediately obtain possession of the box, but Mike never revealed its contents. April 3, 1992, Mike Carmichael's 38th birthday. At 10 p.m., he received an unexpected phone call ordering him back to the base. By the next morning, Mike had still not returned home. On Sunday morning, I called the Army base to find out where my husband was. I talked to a security guard. I was told that he did not see my husband. So I asked him to try to knock on the door of his barracks room. He said that there was no response and the door was locked. An hour later, Sun Hee found her husband's body in his barracks office. He was hanging from a locker and had been dead for several hours. The Army investigation was completed within a few days. They concluded that Mike Carmichael had taken his own life because he was despondent over financial matters and Billy Ray's death. Mike's wife has accepted the ruling. However, his mother and Uncle Oscar have not. 
I think he was angry. And I think he was uh, going to direct his anger towards finding out the reason why or who caused his friend or killed his friend. He was happier than I had seen him in a long time due to the fact that him and Son E had just gotten married in July. They were just like a couple of overgrown kids, really. And he had that, he had his retirement to look forward to. There was no way that Mike would uh, take his life and, and uh, take the chicken way out. Oscar Carmichael soon joined forces with the Hargrove family. They launched a letter-writing campaign asking for the official reports from the military. Unsatisfied with the Army's response, they contacted the office of U.S. Congressman Jay Dickey. Greg Stein is Congressman Dickey's legislative assistant who was assigned to the case. But even the reports that I could get were, were lacking in in uh, the, the photos of the crime scene. Other things were w withheld or, or whited out for certain reasons. And uh, after looking at it, I don't think that they took into account all of the different aspects of, of the case, and they maybe kind of just closed the door uh, without a thorough investigation. I think the signs are there that there is a cover-up of some sort, and I, I don't want to uh, accuse anything or anybody at this time of that, but uh, the reason why there would be a cover-up, I don't know. I, I, that, that's one of the things we want to find out. But I happen to think that if we open this thing up, that we will find an answer. I want you men to clear out, but stay close, because I may want to ask you some questions. Move it. The two families are especially disturbed by the eerie and suspicious similarities in the deaths. Both Billy Ray and Mike had been summoned to the Army barracks. Both men were found hanging just inches from the ground, and both had been tied with parachute cord, which is highly elastic. This is the official crime scene sketch from the U.S. military investigation. Mike Carmichael's body was shown hanging from a row of lockers, a cord wrapped around his neck. The question marks that come up about Sergeant Carmichael start with the fact that he's in a sitting position some three inches from the, from the floor with, the, with the, um, uh, his bo body dangling like that. Even the natural instincts of a person would have your hands falling down or pushing against it. There's not any way that we, our, our rights, our self-preservation self rights are such that we'll do something like that. Also noted in the drawing was a metal box that contained Mike and Billy Ray's personal papers. It was sitting on a desk across the room from Mike's body. Curiously, the box of letters would later disappear, and no one knows what happened to it. Mike Carmichael's family learned of yet another disturbing similarity between the two cases. Just as Billy Ray had abrasions on his face and hands, Sergeant Carmichael had welts on his face and what appeared to be a gash on his forehead. His uncle Oscar is convinced that Mike was struck before he died. You take a pipe, it'll be about an inch or five-eighths inch, and hit him over the head with it. That's the kind of valley that you'd find or crevice, however way you want to describe it. So that's why I say that my nephew, in my opinion, was dead before he was placed in that position. I believe in Billy Ray's case and in Mike's case, too, that uh, something had to be going on that wasn't right, something that they found out about or knew about or maybe was going to expose, and they were gotten rid of. When we return, the intriguing disappearance of Charles Horvath. Did the young hitchhiker choose to drop from sight, or did he meet with foul play? Imagine your 20-year-old son is traveling in a foreign land. Suddenly, his phone calls and postcards stop. Weeks pass with no news, and you begin to fear your child will never come home. 
This is exactly what happened to Denise Horvath Allen. In 1989, her son Charles disappeared in Canada, halfway around the world from their home in England. Ever since, Denise has been trying to find out exactly what happened to her son. In the spring of 1989, Charles Horvath was in the midst of a hitchhiking trip across Canada. In August, he planned to fly to Hong Kong to celebrate his 21st birthday with his mother, Denise, and his stepfather. The birthday festivities promised to be a high point in what had always been a close relationship. Denise was just 19 when Charles was born, 20 when she divorced his father. In some respects, mother and son had grown up together, but before Denise could make final arrangements for the trip, Charles disappeared. I telephoned the RCMP uh, repeatedly, begging them to look for Charles because I was so concerned that something was wrong. I then uh, asked them if they could give me the name of local newspapers to enable me to place an ad as we'd started planning my trip to come and search for my child myself. Kelowna, British Columbia. For thousands of vacationers each year, it is a favorite spot. But for Denise Allen, it had the somber distinction of being the last place on Earth her son was known to have been alive. It was from here that Charles faxed his final letter on May 11, 1989. And it was here that Denise searched for clues to her son's fate during two extended trips between 1990 and 1992. During the first trip, Denise blanketed the town with flyers. She soon heard from a woman named Joanne Zebron, who had met Charles during his stay in Kelowna. When I first met Charles, it was of this charming, good-looking guy who was uh, obviously uh, um, new to Canada. And I really liked him. I thought, well, here's a unique person. That's my mom. Oh, she's gorgeous. Yeah. He loved his family. He showed me pictures. He, he, had, he was so proud of all these um, photographs of his mother. They were very close. It was obvious they were close. The last time Charles dropped by the apartment Joanne shared with her mother, he arrived uninvited. Hello? Is it Joanne? Yes, it is. At the time, Joanne's brother was in town for a special family reunion and the Zebras politely refused Charles's request to come up and visit. Actually, it isn't a very good time right now. There was this momentary silence, and what stays in our mind, fresh forever, is how he went, but it's Charles! <laughs> and like, of course you're going to let me up. And we just couldn't. We're, we're having a family dinner, I'm sorry. Joanne told Denise that the brief chat was her last contact with Charles. To Joanne's best recollection, the episode had taken place in May of 1989, the same month Denise had last heard from Charles. You keep telling me that you're afraid for his safety. Why? Leads began streaming in. Denise soon learned that while he was in Kelowna, Charles had stayed at a campground located in a rough part of town. Who else was there? Can you remember anybody else? In spite of the campground's unsavory reputation, Denise knew that she had no choice but to go there and investigate. I wanted to go over to the campsite to inquire, but I was very apprehensive of going. Um, eventually, I had the courage and went across to see them to see if they remembered Charles. Excuse me. I'm looking for my last son, Charles Horvath. He disappeared a year ago in Kelowna. I wonder if you remember him staying here? Yeah, I remember him. The campground manager stuff. said that Charles left abruptly in May of 1989, abandoning his tent and all his possessions. Most had been disposed of, but the few that remained were close at hand. I was just numb. I went down to the police station and I was told that they were going to inform Interpol to get his dental records and the file was being passed on to homicide. 
I was also told that they believed my son to be dead, that we may never find his body or what happened to him. Uh, it's very unfortunate that a comment like that would be made, and I would have to say that that would be that member's personal opinion and certainly not the view of the police force. Uh, I don't know upon what he based that other than the fact items were left at a campsite, and in my opinion, that does not substantiate that. But on March 17, 1992, the case took a sudden, ominous turn. Denise came back to her hotel room to find an unsigned letter scrawled in a rough hand. I seen your ad in the paper, looking for your son. I seen him May 26. We were partying, and two people knocked him out. But he died. His body's in the lake by the bridge. Lake Okanagan, just outside of Kelowna, is one of the deepest lakes in the world. Local divers immediately volunteered to look for the body of Charles Horvath. For five days, the search yielded nothing, but the mysterious informant was apparently watching the divers every move. Denise received a second note saying they were looking on the wrong side of the bridge. We're stopping every 10, 15 feet. Equipped with a submersible camera, the divers began to search at the new location. One day later, they told police that they had found a body. The fear in the young officer's eyes told me that he thought it was Charles. The total panic on their faces I, um, I was hysterical in the bathroom crying, which I assume it's quite normal of every, any parent. I just couldn't believe that he was dead. Even before authorities had identified the corpse, local papers were trumpeting the news that the body was that of Charles Horvath. The coroner came to see me at the motel. I asked him, if it was Charles, was it, no. I asked him if it was good news or bad, and he said it wasn't Charles. The dead man was later identified as a 64-year-old Kelowna resident, a probable suicide. Police now believe that the anonymous notes were hoaxes and the discovery of a body just a coincidence. Once again, it seemed that Charles must be alive. Then a man named Gino Borden came forward, claiming to have seen Charles just before he disappeared. Gino and his son had pitched their tent near Charles while he was at the campground. He was a nice guy, he was a good friend. He used to always come over to our camp, little camp, and uh, have coffee in the morning. And, uh, play frisbee and catch with my son and just sit and chat with us. What should I do with him? You should take him to Hong Kong with you. That's it. Pack him in my suitcase. There you go. Here's some coffee, some sugar in that on the table. He was uh, a friendly guy, a real friendly guy, probably too friendly. Uh, he seemed, I don't know, naive on that there about, uh, like he wasn't, he, he'd talk to anybody, he'd make friends with anybody. Gino's recollections added details to the campground manager's account. Gino had last seen Charles during a raucous all-night party at the campground. The next morning, Gino had awakened to find Charles gone and his things left behind. When I first established that Charles had abandoned his belongings at the campsite, it was assumed that something terrible had happened to him, which caused him to leave his belongings because it was so unlike him to have left his photographs behind, which were very important to him. Gino's story seemed to confirm the theory that Charles had met with foul play, but continued investigation revealed that Charles was very much alive long after he left the campground. Hello? Is it Joanne? Charles supposedly called at Joanne Zebroff's apartment in May of 1989, but police later discovered that Joanne was mistaken. Charles had actually come by in July, two full months after he had last contacted his mother. 
This revelation has led some to conclude that for unknown personal reasons, Charles intentionally severed contact with his family. During our investigation, we contacted two of Charles' relatives back in eastern Canada. They related to us that uh, during his time there with them, he did advise both relatives that it was his intention when discussing his family situation to disappear off the face of the earth and that his mother would never find him and that he wanted to carry on with his own life. It is totally out of character for him to have gone out intentionally to break away from his family because he wasn't that kind of boy. He may have tried to imply to uh, people who he wanted to impress that he didn't need his mum. What 20-year-old does need the mum or would admit to needing them? It's not very macho. Four years have passed without word from Charles Horvath, but police have received tips from nearly 200 people some claim to have seen Charles hitchhiking in Canada as recently as April of 1992. Others are equally certain that Charles Horvath never made it out of Kelowna alive. If Charles is out there in this world, you know, in a gutter somewhere, he needs picking up and bringing home and getting medical help or whatever kind of help is required. If not, if he is dead and he's been murdered, he needs burying. I've been asking for help for so many years because of my fear that something's happened to him. And it, it'll only be when, if he's found dead that I'll be proven right. What a way to be proven right. Charles Horvath would now be 25 years old. He is six feet tall with dark brown hair, dark brown eyes, and a tattoo on his left arm. When last seen, Charles weighed 165 pounds. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, when a 17-year-old girl disappeared in 1974, her family became convinced that she had been abducted by members of a renegade motorcycle gang. The girl's mother soon embarked on a dark journey into the biker subculture. Nearly 20 years later, she believes her daughter is still alive, still perhaps being held against her will. Join me next time for an all-new show. Perhaps you may be able to solve a mystery. Thank mm -hmm. you.